Shalom. Very good morning to all of you, especially for those of you who have been visiting us, as well as those of you who have, are visiting us for the very first time. I'm Pastor Desmond So, and I'm the pastor of Bethany Evangelical Free Church together with Pastor Wenping. We serve the Lord uh, faithfully here in this wonderful, beautiful family church we have in 133 Fidelo Street. And as we begin this new year, I'm sure, as what Julian has said, although he has not made his resolution yet, some of us have made some resolutions. Forbes um, Health tells us in this survey that was done in October last year that the, the top three priorities of people, their resolutions are aspirations to improve their fitness, finances, and mental health. Mental health in the last three years has been featured in the top five of Forbes survey. I wonder how many of us had similar ones here. You don't have to tell me now, all right? But I'm pretty sure somewhere, if you have made some resolutions, somewhere along those listed, about 15 of them altogether, somewhere along those resolutions, you would have had a similar match there. And today, as we begin this new year, I want us to ponder over this. Only one, just one thing you've got. You know, one thing that you really need to focus on this year. What would that be? I'm a pastor, and my hope is in that list, somewhere there, that you have something along the lines like, I want to improve my relationship with God. I want to work on my identity in Christ, my security in Christ. If there's one truth, if there's one anchor, if there's one source that encompasses everything and fulfills our needs, our aspirations, I hope that you'll find that in Christ Jesus himself. In fact, as we consider these New Year resolutions that we have and the priorities in the next 12 months, I want us to know that if Jesus is all with God, he is all we need. Let me say that one more time. In fact, I'll say it many times throughout this whole sermon. If Jesus is all with God, He is all we need. Over the next three months, we will be exploring on this series in Ephesians. And I'm so happy to let you know that uh, we have lined up speakers and we over the next 12 months, in fact, for those of you who are new to our church, we preach through books of the Bible, faithfully, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, line by line, word for word. And Paul was writing to the Ephesians and writing to us even till today. And I've entitled this series called Reconciled to Reach. Let me say that one more time. Reconciled to to reach. Paul has called his disciples, his faithful followers in Ephesus to walk worthily and to relate rightly. This is a call to live rightly in the light of what Jesus has done and achieved on the cross of Calvary. To reconcile us to God and so that because of that reconciliation and the forgiveness of sins, we can subsequently reach out to the relationships that are broken around us to restore us to a right relationship with one another. Now, I won't dwell too much into the background information and the details today because next week, again, for those of us who are new, we, every time we start a new series, we have this thing called a Sermon Series Orientation, SSO, and we have a treat from Pastor Wenping who will be leading us in the SSO after the service next week. But I want us to imagine for a while, Paul being imprisoned in Rome, writing this letter. This is somewhere around AD 60 to 62 or so. Paul is being imprisoned in this tiny little cell of his. He's spent many years, in fact, three years as what we read in Acts chapter 19, that he spent three years there and he's writing a love letter to the people in Ephesus. He has spent considerable time discipling them. And now during that confinement itself in the Roman cell, he pens a letter that resonates even till today through the centuries. 
And his purpose is twofold to unveil the deep mysteries of God's plan and to help illuminate the transformative power of being in Christ Jesus. If there's one thing, one thing that Paul wants the Ephesians to grasp with unwavering certainty, that nothing will shake them of their faith, is their identity in Christ. If there's one thing that transcends time and resonates even till today to all of us here, is that profound truth that if Jesus is all with God, He is all we need. But then, that begs the question, right? How has our union, our relationship with Christ shaped our lives? How can our association or being called Christ followers, Christians, really mold and motivate us into 2024? To answer that question, we need to ask that question throughout the whole series of uh, Ephesians and to find the answers throughout these entire six chapters. And in the passage that was just being read to us by Julian, thank you, Julian. I know you struggled a little bit with the reading of it. There's a reason why, and I'll explain to you later on, all right? I have problems reading that whole entire passage as well. If there's one thing that you have noticed, I hope you've been paying attention to Julian's reading, is that there's a refrain, a constant refrain. Do you hear it? It is the word, in Christ. In Christ in Christ. Verses 3, verses 4, verses 6, 9, sorry, 6, 7, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, all had the word in Christ or in Him repeated again and again. You can circle it in your Bibles if you want to. At least nine times in that, just at verses 3 to 13, we hear Paul impressing upon the Ephesians that we must be in Christ. And the theologian, the great teacher, Arthur Ping, in his commentary said this, that the sum and the substance, the center and the circumference, the light and the life of Christianity, you and my faith, is Christ. That summarizes in essence what is really trying to say that if Jesus is all with God, He is all we need. Everything centers around our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Jesus is all with God and He's all we need. But how can our relationship with Him shape our lives? And this is where I want to propose, based on the verses read for us today, that there are three specific areas which Paul addresses as he expounds on what it means to be in Christ. Those three things are our identity, our unity, and our security. Our identity, our personal self-identity, our unity within the body of Christ, and our security. If you think about these three things, do you not realize that it matches even the top three of the needs of people, the resolutions that people make? Our identity. When we want to get fit, we want to look good, right? If we think about the unity, it's about what? Relationships, right? And so therefore, when you think about that, many people will realize that when, when Fox made those lists itself, it is all about what? The mental health itself. Because when you have poor mental health, you have disunity. And when you think about finances, what is it all about? It's about our security. So when you match that with the uh, priorities and, and the the things that people aim for each year, the resolutions that they make, is similar. See, what we make today is similar to what people are also wishing for and hoping for 2,000 years ago. In fact, this repeated phrase, in Christ, 
in uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 14, not only shapes our entire life, it will become our threefold blessings. What do I mean by that? Read verse 3. Verse 3 says, Blessed, first blessing, blessed be the Father and be, be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Three blessings. And these are the three blessings that God wants us to have when we are in Christ Jesus. The blessings of identity, a secure identity, the blessings of unity within the body of Christ, and of course, the security of our salvation. These are the three blessings. Let me explain and digest that together with you as we expound on this passage together. Verses 4 to 6 begins the first blessing of identity. There are only two key verbs I want us to pay attention to in verses 4 to 6. The first is that He has chosen or predestined us. And the second is that He blessed us. Notice, I've underlined it for you over, over here, notice that these are all the initiative of God. There's nothing that we have done to earn His choosing and His blessing. That's the first thing I want us to notice even in the grammar itself. It tells us that we have already been chosen, we have already been blessed. The second thing I want us to notice here is that it is written in a past tense. That means it is already a done deal. God has already blessed us and chosen us in Christ Jesus. So what does it mean to say that He has chosen us and He has blessed us? And how does that help shape our identity? How does that help us in our 2024 and beyond? The very first thing you must understand is that by being chosen, our identity is therefore rooted in Christ before the foundation of the world. Put it another way, in, in verse 5, it says here, He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of His will. That means what? God intentionally, God deliberately, God purposely, God willingly made us part of his family. Our significance and our worth are intimately tied to our connection with Christ. This divine election not only shapes our identity, but it also lays the foundational work, the groundwork for our holiness and blamelessness before him. In fact, that is found in verse 4. If you want to be blameless and if you want to be righteous and holy before God, verse 4 says that we should be holy and blameless before Him. The requirement is that we must be in Christ Jesus. Have you ever felt that you are unwanted? I mean, seriously, you know, you're not part of a team, you know, you're being sidelined, you're being left out. I did. Growing up, I was the youngest of all my cousins, and we had a big family. In fact, just down the road in Jalan Daud, uh, that's where my old, old house is, you know, and my uncles and aunties would all stay together with my grandma, including my dad. And I remember when we were playing together, there's 20 over of us kids. I'm the youngest, uh, five years old, I already know that I'm the dummy. You know, when you play a game, you, there's a dummy. He's actually not involved in the game. You know, you're, you're the person who's like just a token participant, <laughs> right? Because why? Me, being five years old, how many games can I win for my team? Right? If we play uh, uh, catch, catching spiders, I cannot catch any spiders. You know, if we play like skipping ropes, I can never play skipping ropes and jump as high as my cousins. If we play, say, five stones, my, my 
fingers are not as big as that. I cannot grab even two or three at the very most of five stones. By the way, if you do not know those games, these are games that we were playing when we were growing up in the 70s and even in the 80s. But the, the wonderful thing is this. I always look forward to those games with my cousins around 4 or 5 o'clock in the evening. Why? Because I had this one cousin, this cousin who will always choose me despite and in spite of me not being able to contribute to the winning of the team, his team itself. In fact, every time I join, he probably loses <laughs> the, the, the games because we have so many of us, there's usually about three or four groups. And it really felt good, right? That you are wanted, that you're needed, you're part of a team. It felt good to be chosen. And in the same way, God chooses us in spite of all our problems, our lack of holiness and righteousness, our stubbornness, even our personality that's not really very nice at times. That itself gives us our identity. It comforts us, it secures us. But not only just that, not only did He chose us, the second thing that I want us to realize is that He also blesses us. In fact, that blessing is bestowed upon us through His beloved. This is the unmerited favor that is based on our relationship with Jesus Christ. If you are curious about what are these blessings, these spiritual blessings, I've listed for you in the entire book of Ephesians. There are more than this, by the way. I'm just listing a few of them for you to consider. We get eternal life. In chapter 2, we read that. We are reconciled with God. We have access to God the Father. We, have, we are now joined as, that means we have inheritance, which in this passage is mentioned twice. We have the strength and the love, and we have the spiritual blessings and spiritual gifts that is given to us. We have renewal and righteousness, we even can put on the spiritual armor, the full armor of God to protect us. That is the blessing we get. And we have already been given those things by God Himself. So how can union in Christ shape our lives, mold our lives, transform us? Knowing, believing, and trusting that God chose us, He blessed us, will give us security in our identity that we are loved and wanted. That means that we, what? We only need Jesus, right? He's the only thing we've got and He's the only thing we need. That means that we can be confident when we pray, knowing that God hears us and answers us according to His will. That means that we can be healthy in our self-esteem. Yes, we have some weight to lose, but we are still loved by God. That means what? We are resilient in times of challenges and changes. And also we are free from comparisons with other people who are perhaps way better than, than us. And this all leads to security in relationships and joy in our lives. If Jesus is all with God, He is all we need, right? But that's not the only blessing that He has given to us in our identity. The second blessing He has given to us based on verse 3 is that there is unity. Unity that we all enjoy in Christ Jesus. And that's taken from verses 7 to 10. Now, I'll be the first to tell you that unity is elusive. Unity is hard. Earlier today, I was just meeting up a very good friend that I have not seen for a long time. We've known each other for at least 26, 27 years. <laughs> and uh, I said to him, I said, all churches are good churches. It is what? It's the people that makes it not so good. <laughs> Especially the pastor sometimes. Yeah? So unity is difficult and it's elusive because there's diversity and differences in language, in race, in culture, in nationality, and even shared experiences. 
Earlier in the worship team, are you aware that there are three nationalities praising God and leading us in the praises to God? An Aussie, <laughs> someone from Nagaland, India, and someone from Singapore. So there is great diversity within the body of Christ. And if Jesus is all with God, how can we keep this motley crew, you know, this disparate crew, this group of people who are so different all together? How? How can we have this unity when we have this union with Christ? I'd like to suggest to us two important factors that will help us shape our unity. The first is knowing that we have been redeemed and forgiven. The second is living in accordance to His purpose. Both are found in the passage in verses 7 to 10. The first, knowing that we have been redeemed and forgiven. Redemption and forgiveness we experience through the blood of Jesus Christ will lead us to self-awareness and examination. When we know that we have been forgiven, when we know that we are no longer in offence with God, it will then cause us to quieten down our spirit and consider who we are in the eyes of God. That itself will begin our process of self-reflection and self-awareness. And Paul wants us to know that it is according to the riches of His grace. That forgiveness, that redemption, is not because of how good we are. It's because of God's grace. And not just any grace, the wealth, the riches, the abundance, the overflowing of the grace of God. We have not earned it, we have not worked for it, and we have no claim over all of that grace and the riches that God wants to bless us. Why? Because, very simply, Paul said in another letter that all of us have sinned. All of us have made mistakes in our life, and we have fallen short of the glory of God. Which is why none of us, not even one, is righteous. Not even the most holy and nice person you know especially not this pastor standing before you. But it is by grace that we have been saved and forgiven through Christ itself. In fact, Paul explains and expounds on that in chapter 2, especially verses 8 and 9. Jesus is all we need. But how does that unite and glue us together? How? How? When we realize that we are undeserving, we are wretched and helpless to save ourselves, and then we compare that with how generous, how gracious, how loving God is to forgive us of our trespasses and to redeem us, then, guess what? We are able to extend that forgiveness to other people. Because two things happen when we realize that, that we cannot save ourselves, and yet God still extends that grace to us. We will be grateful, I hope so, <laughs> and we will be humbled. Gratefulness and humility will lead to healthier relationships, reconciliations, and especially, this is important, it unshackles the bitterness that is in your heart. When you are bitter, you can never forgive. But when you realize that you yourself do not deserve forgiveness, and yet God forgave you, guess what? You are able to forgive even someone who has hurt you so, so much. Grace itself is not cheap to God because it costs His Son's life. And I want us to remind ourselves that forgiven people forgive, just as gratefulness beget grace. Unity in the body of Christ is possible because if Jesus is all we've got, He is all we need. But that's 
the first thing that I want us to realize when we talk about unity. Unity is possible when we realize that we are redeemed and forgiven, but unity also is possible when we live according to His purposes. In fact, verses 9 and 10 tells us that in Christ, God has revealed His master plan of redemption for whole humanity. All things find their purpose and their unity in Him, in Jesus Christ Himself. And that unity transcends, overreaches, and extends even way beyond our individual identity, our needs, our desires. It connects you and I together as one body of Christ. Have you ever been to a team sports whereby you have no clue what to do? Have you been in a team in your workplace where there is lack of leadership and direction? Have you been in a church that is listless, that you have no idea what's going to happen in the next 12 months? The good news is Bethany is not like that, all right? After the service, please stay behind. We will have our very first quarterly fellowship where the leaders, including the pastors, will be sharing with you over the next 12 months where we're heading. We will tell you exactly what books we'll be covering. We'll be sharing with you what kind of training we'll be giving you, what kind of opportunities that you can serve, you can put your hands into and use your spiritual gifts. See, there is clarity in direction. But in the absence of that, guess what? We are all like, you know, when you chop off a chicken's head, do you know that the chicken still flutters around? You know, we are like headless chickens fluttering around without knowing where we are heading, not knowing that we are losing our lives. But the beautiful thing is this, God provided that blueprint, that master plan for us. And that master plan is simply put, to love Him, and to hate him, in the words of my professor in seminary. He said that all these three years of learning, when I was doing my Master's of Divinity in SBC, uh, Henry Baldwin, Dr. Henry Baldwin said this, at the end of everything, we asked, do you have last words for us? And he said, oh, last words, okay. Love God, hate sin. That's all he said. Love God, hate sin. And he said that meditate on that for the next 20 years of your ministry. And I have been thinking about it. And the truth of the matter is, that is the essence of all. This is a nuclear submarine captain from the USA who became a professor and the dean of SBC. Henry Baldwin, you can Google him. <laughs> and he said this, love God. He said, that is the master plan of God. And I added to that, share the good news as well. Because why? Even Paul himself said the same thing to the Ephesians. And I summarize it for us, redeem to reach the people around us. That's the must plan. And I invite you to come to our quarterly fellowship to see how we are fulfilling, loving God, hating sin, sharing the good news by being able to reach out to the community around us. When a collective group of people, of different people gather, it is always inevitable that we will have tensions we, have, we will have differences of opinions and objectives. And guess what? When you have differences in opinions and objectives, it always leads to objections. But being in Christ helps us to live our lives according to God's purposes, not our purposes and plans. We follow His word, we follow His will, and we follow His ways. When Jesus is all we need, we do not do things out of selfish agendas. We do not hide our motives and reveal it only later on. We don't feel threatened because someone is better nor bitter when there are more capable people around us. When our plans differ, we do not, we do not cry murder. Right? Why? Because we have a master plan, a blueprint that God has already given to us. And when we live aligned to God's will and God's purposes in Christ Jesus, we will have unity in the body 
of Christ. In fact, our church, I'm sure many of you memorize this, our church vision is what? To be a <laughs> holy, loving, and united church. That's one of our core things that we want to do. And what is Jesus' master plan? He said it in one sentence as well. In Luke chapter 19, verse 10, to seek and to save the lost when he saw Zacchaeus on the sycamore tree. So how can unity, union with Christ shape our lives? We know that Christ shapes our identity and gives us our unity in the body of Christ. That is the two blessings that we have. What about the third blessing that I mentioned before? Turn to your neighbours right now. I want you to tell them what are the two things that we have learned so far. Number one is we will enjoy security in our identity. Secondly, we will have unity in the body of Christ. Turn to your neighbour. In Christ, we will have secure identity and we will have unity. Turn to your neighbours and talk to the neighbours right now. In Christ, we will have unity and we will have secure identity. Good. The reason why I'm asking you to do this is because some of you are already lost because it seems like this has many sub points and sub. Some of you are writing your notes and all that. Don't worry, all these are all written. So if you want the full manuscript, I can give it to you as well. But the third thing, there's a reason why you may be having difficulty tracing the line of thought. Let me just give it to you right now. In the original text, verses 3 to 14, is the longest sentence in the New Testament. In fact, it is only one sentence in the original Greek. Many scholars have debated what is the main point of the passage, but none of them dispute the fact that it is about Jesus Christ and what he has accomplished on the cross. And so therefore, when Julian had difficulty reading it, because why? You don't know where to pause, what to do. Paul was like bah, 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 writing in his, maybe, maybe he forgotten to put a full stop, a comma and all that. I'm not sure, but it was so long that even reading it in the original text is difficult to trace its line of thought. But I've given you three things. Identity, unity, and the last one is? Wow, you're paying attention. Praise God. <laughs> security. What is our security when we are in Christ Jesus? What do we hope to have when we are in Christ? And put it in Paul's words, right? How, how could it be that when we are in Christ, that He is all that we need? What guarantees our inheritance? You see, that is why when we go to... Oops, I think we are moving too far ahead. Okay? No, we are not moving too far ahead. Where do we get our guarantee in our inheritance? The guarantee, the security that we have. And the first thing I want us to realize is that that security is found only and only in one very important fact. Once you believe in Jesus Christ. The moment you accepted Christ, when you are in Christ, God gives us that guarantee of inheritance the guarantee of the peace that surpasses all understanding, the guarantee of all the spiritual blessings that I mentioned to you earlier, the guarantee of a strong, firm identity. And that can only be found by the promised Holy Spirit. In fact, he uses a very beautiful imagery of a seal. That seal itself will, and the seal is the Holy Spirit, will guarantee us of our security in our lives, not the security that we have in our Swiss bank accounts. All right? The Holy Spirit as our promised seal is anchored in the relationship we have in Jesus Christ. And our confidence is not 
resting on some shifting circumstances, but our unchanging relationship with God Himself through Jesus Christ. God, in fact, does not make any empty promises, which is why Paul said that those who are in Christ are sealed, sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. This seal makes us as God's very own and assures us of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, as what verse 14 says. Now, in ancient times, you must understand that in ancient times, the seals are very, very important. It is a mark of our confirmation and ownership. That means when you have a seal there, it means that that thing, that object or that document belongs to you. When we have a seal of the Holy Spirit, it means that you and I are children of God. God has adopted us as His children. God owns us. God protects us. He identifies us as part of the covenant community. The very fact that we have a holy communion identifies and seals us together with the Holy Spirit that we are the body of Christ. In fact, it also identifies us for those of us who are in the community of faith, for those of us especially who have heard the word of truth and the gospel of your salvation and believed in Him. That's the requirement. That you hear the words of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believe. That is how you are in Christ. You are not in Christ because of a church membership. You are not in Christ because you come to church regularly. You are not in Christ because you give your tithes and offerings. You are not in Christ because you serve in a worship team or even go to the seminary. You are in Christ because you have heard the good news and you believe in that good news. And that good news is Jesus Christ. That's what seals are for. It's a confirmation of ownership. But it also tells us that we are secure and protected by that seal. A seal represents the absolute power of the person who puts that seal. Now, if you break that seal, you are finding trouble with that person who puts that seal. Am I right to say that? Have you ever opened a letter that doesn't belong to you? Some of you nodded your head. <laughs> oh dear. I have when I was a young child. Very naughty. Right? Now, do you know that it's a criminal offence to do that? Even till today. Especially if it is sealed and it's only to be opened by the receiver, the, the person who is being addressed. In ancient times, if you break a seal, you're liable, not only just to be, you know, like go, going to a court and, and being fined and even imprisoned, you can even be put to death. Remember when Jesus died, what did the Pharisees and the chief priests ask of Pilate? His body is put in the tomb, rolled a huge stone, and guess what? They asked for the seal, Caesar's seal to be there, so that nobody dares to open it. If you break the seal, guess what? You're fighting trouble with Caesar. And not only just that, not only the stone, not only the seal, they even ask for soldiers, 3S. Triple security. But we know that Jesus rose again from the dead. <coughs> Amen to that. Now, for those of us who are in Christ Jesus, we have the protection, the security found Nowhere else, not even by the most powerful man on earth, but by the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Creator God Himself, who gave us that guarantee of the seal of the Holy Spirit. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is our hope of a secure, certain future. It gives us the assurance that Jesus is our Lord, that He's all we need, and He's all we need with God. In Christ, we remind ourselves this, that if Jesus is all with God, He's all we need. 
Would you say that with me together? One, two, three. If Jesus is all we've got, He's all we need. May this refrain be yours throughout 2024 and beyond. As we stand on the threshold of a new year, as you make your New Year resolutions, we have a blank canvas stretched before us to be painted with our hopes, our dreams, our resolutions. But you know what? This is also a time of reflection. That if Jesus is all we've got, He's really all we need. And as we go through this series, may this constantly remind us that Jesus is all we need. We can be secure in our identity. We can be united in the body of Christ. And ultimate, ultimately, we can be secure in, and assured of our salvation because of the Holy Spirit living in and through us. If Jesus is all we've got, He's all we need. Amen? May the Lord help all of us.